I have a word from the Lord for us today that's been on my heart for two weeks. Uh, to stand here this afternoon feeling like a worthless vessel. <coughs> to share the truth. We do love you. We just told you that. And we need your strength and enablement today to proclaim what you have put upon our hearts for us as a church and for us as individuals. Use us. Hide us behind the cross of Calvary. May you be uplifted and glorified and May you bring me and every person in this room before we leave here today to a fresh point of surrender and commitment to you. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Now, whether you believe it or not, I went to college. <laughs> uh, in fact, I went to Bible college for four years. But uh, most of my theology I learned as a little kid in Sunday school. Remember Sunday school? Uh -huh. It usually took place before morning worship, and we sat in rooms and we learned about God. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay, just check it. My belief system concerning God and the things of God, to a large degree, were formed by the songs that we would sing even as a little old guy, in what they called way back then, the beginner's Sunday school class. The beginner's Sunday school department. And then, as a kid, I couldn't wait to get there on Sunday and to sing some of those songs. Here's the theology that was instilled into me. Some of you may remember this one, the devil is a sly old fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in a box, I'd lock the door, and I'd throw away the key for all those dirty tricks he's played on me. I'm glad I got converted, the chorus said, by trusting in God's Word. Remember this one? Running over? Huh? My cup is full and running over. Since the Lord saved me, I'm as happy as can be. My cup is full and running over. I always like this one too. I'm in the Lord's army. I'm too young to march in the infantry. And I always like that part. Shoot the artillery. I'm in the Lord's army. I don't know if there was any Bible for this one, but we used to sing one that was called, We're Going to a Mansion on a Happy Day Express. The letters on the engine spell J-E-S-U-S. The Lord calls out from heaven. I'll gladly answer yes. I'm going to a mansion uh, on a happy day express. We didn't say if there was another one. You can't go to heaven on a roller skate. <laughs> we used to say one day if we all pull together, yeah. how happy we'll be for your work is my work and my work is your work, and our work is God's work if we all pull together. And then, of course, there was one that probably is best known and favorite of maybe all of us here today that simply is the heart of what the Bible and, and God is all about. Jesus loves me. This I know. Amen. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but I am strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. But um, there was another one that became uh, one of my most favorites. As a kid, every summer I grew up on the Lake of the Ozarks. My dad was over all of the Assemblies of God churches from the Missouri River South in the state of Missouri. And so when school was out, we moved to the Lake of the Ozarks, and I lived there all summer, and I fished every day. Uh, 
old caretaker at the property taught me how to catch three and four fish at a time mm -hmm. on those crappie beds. And uh, I love fishing. But as a kid, we used to sing this one too. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. And the motion that went with that, when you get to that fishers of men, you would go, <laughs> man, I love doing that. And I'd always ask, can we sing that one? And that chorus was based upon the passage of Scripture where I ask you to turn this afternoon, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading with verse 18 and just four of the verses. Follow along as I read it to you this afternoon. Verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets, and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Now, this is not just an isolated case of one-time thing. If you were to look over in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, at the end of that chapter, there's a story about three guys, three men, who approached Jesus. And they got one thing on their mind, man. They are eager to follow him. And it's kind of surprising, but in Luke 9, Jesus tries to talk those three guys out of doing it. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but you read Luke 9. Jesus tries to talk them out of it. Listen to the first guy. He says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus responded with these words. Foxes have holes and birds, have the air, birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, Jesus told this guy, if you're going to follow me, you can expect to be homeless. The second guy, Jesus told him, uh, this guy told Jesus that his father, my dad just died, my father has just died, and the man wanted to go back, read it in Luke 9, he wanted to bury his father and then follow Jesus. And Jesus replied, let the dead bury their own dead, but you... You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Let's translate it for us today. Jesus was saying this. Don't even go to your dad's funeral. There are more important things to do. The third guy approached Jesus and he told him, Hey, I want to follow you. I'm in on this. I want to follow you. But he said, before I do, I need to go say goodbye to my family. I need to tell my family goodbye. But read the account in Luke 9, Jesus wouldn't let him. And Jesus told this guy, no one who puts his hand to the plow is fit. If he looks back, he is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Plainly put, a relationship with Jesus Christ requires a total, no strings attached, a superior, above all else, exclusive devotion to Jesus Christ. Being homeless, let somebody else bury your dad, don't even say goodbye to your family. And from all we can tell, in Luke 9, Jesus was successful in persuading these guys not to follow him. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what you think about all of that, but I want you to see this this afternoon. Jesus was not using a gimmick to get more followers. He wasn't trying to make it easy. He was simply and very boldly making it clear from the get-go that if you're going to follow me, 
If you're going to follow Jesus, you abandon everything. Everything, your needs, your desires, even your family. On another occasion, Jesus was surrounded by a bunch of people, by a crowd of eager followers. Man, they were excited about all of this. And Jesus turns to them and he speaks these words. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, Jesus said, he cannot be my disciple. Now, with that statement, he probably lost most of us at hello, you know. I mean, these are tough words that Jesus is saying, but he's not through. Listen to him. As he goes on, he says, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And Jesus finishes, I mean, this is really seeker-sensitive, huh? His plea with a pull at the heartstrings, and this is the bottom line with Jesus. And I want you to listen to him. He says, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Give up everything you have. Carry a cross. And hate your family. And that's not all. That's still not all. Mark chapter 10 tells us of another potential follower who shows up to Jesus. And here was a guy. He was rich. He was young. He was intelligent. He was influential. He seemingly had his act together. He was a prime prospect. And he was eager. He was gung-ho. He was ready to go. And he comes running up to Jesus. And the word tells us he bows with the feet of Jesus. And he speaks these words. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if we as contemporaries would have been in Jesus' shoes, we'd probably been thinking, man, this is our chance. What a great opportunity. We're just getting to pray a simple prayer, sign the card, bow your head, repeat after me. This guy's in. He could be a real blessing. This is no brainer. we got to get this guy in. Instead, Jesus told him one thing. Jesus said, go, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come and follow me. What was Jesus thinking? What was he thinking? Now here's the rest of the story. For that guy, the cost was too high. The cost was too high. The guy just couldn't do it. Okay, let's go back to Matthew chapter 4 for just a moment. And this simple invitation, this simple call to Jesus' disciples to follow me. You see, the call from Jesus Christ to follow him carried with it radical implications for those guys' lives. Jesus was calling them to give up, to abandon their comforts, to forsake, to walk away from anything and everything and anyone who was familiar to them. As I studied this, I saw he was calling them to abandon their careers. This guy comes walking down the beach one day. Here's these guys fishing. And all of a sudden he said, come follow me. And they were reorienting, reorienting their entire life's work, what they had devoted their lives to. All of a sudden, they were now swallowed up in his. Think about it. Their plans, their dreams, their hopes, their ambitions were now swallowed up in doing what Jesus wanted to do. Give it up. Walk away from it all. Now, come follow me. 
In effect, that's what Jesus was saying. He was also calling them to abandon their possessions. Look at the words of Jesus. Drop your nets. Give up your trades as successful fishermen. Leave it all behind. He was calling them to abandon their families and their friends. In Luke 14, we see the prophetic words of Jesus becoming alive. When they were cold, they had to leave their father and their families to follow Jesus. And ultimately, Jesus was calling them to abandon themselves. Not what they wanted to do, but what Jesus wanted to do. They were leaving certainty for uncertainty. They were leaving security and safety for dangers that they knew not of. They were leaving self-preservation, looking out for number one, for self-denunciation. And they lived too in a world that prized promoting oneself to give it all up to follow a teacher who told them, sooner or later, you're going to have to crucify yourself. And in reality, history gives to us the result, almost all of them. Think about this. All of them who responded to the call of Jesus to follow me, almost all of them would lose their lives because they responded to that simple little invitation from Jesus, follow me. So, what about us? Huh? What about us? I mean, let's put ourselves for just a moment this afternoon, in the shoes of these eager followers of Jesus Christ in that very first century. What if I were the potential disciple that Jesus comes along and he told me to drop my nets? What if you were the man whom Jesus told, come follow me, but no, you can't even say goodbye to your family? What if we were told we got to hate our families and give up everything in order to follow Jesus? <clears throat> you see, this is where I believe we come face to face with a very dangerous reality as contemporary Christians. If I read the Word of God correctly, and especially the Gospels and the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we do, no question about it, we do have to give up everything we have to follow Jesus. Everything. We do have to love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in such a way that it makes the closest relationship we may have upon this earth with a husband, a wife, parent, a son or a daughter, whoever it may be. We have to love Jesus Christ in such a way that it makes our closest relationships in this world appear or look like hate. Hey, it's entirely possible that Jesus would tell us to sell everything we have and to give it to the poor. Do you know what? I've tried to rationalize this for a couple weeks. He might ask us to do that, but we don't want to believe it. We're afraid of what it might mean for our lives and so we explain away and we rationalize away these passages of Scripture. We do. We sit in our churches and we sit in our Christian home and we rationalize them away. Jesus really wouldn't come along and tell us not to bury our father. Or he wouldn't really tell us not to say goodbye to our family. Or Jesus didn't really mean to sell all we have and give it to the poor. What Jesus really meant was, and I've listened to Christians all of my life explain those verses away. I've listened to college professors endeavor to instill in me and others 
that this isn't what Jesus was really talking about, what Jesus really meant was. Can I just pause for a moment this afternoon and tell you that when we start doing that, we are taking the Jesus of the Bible and we are twisting him into a version of Jesus that we are more comfortable with. We have grown very content and comfortable with a nice middle class American Jesus. A Jesus who doesn't mind materialism and a Jesus who would never ever call us to give away everything that we have. Do that in what I signed up for. A Jesus who would never expect us to forsake our closest of relationships so he could receive all of our affection. Think about that. A Jesus who is fine with nominal devotion that doesn't infringe upon our comforts, that does not call upon this guy standing before you today or upon you, that does not call for lifestyle change because, hey, after all, Jesus loves us just the way we are. You know, we want a Jesus who wants us to be balanced. A Jesus who wants us to avoid dangerous extremes. A Jesus who wants us to avoid danger altogether. A, a Jesus who wants to bring to you and I comfort and, and all kinds of prosperity as we live out what I believe has become our Christian spin upon the American dream. Do you know what? I keep hearing his voice. I've heard it strongly these past. I keep hearing it in the depths of my spirit. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Wake up and realize that, the, the, that there are infinitely more important things in your life than whatever's on television or football or your 401k or all kinds of stuff that fill and consume our time and our lives day after day. Where are the Christians in the church that is going to wake up and realize there are some real battles to be fought? When are we going to wake up and stir ourselves to the countless multitudes of people who don't know Jesus Christ and are currently destined to a Christless eternity without God? Wake up. You and I have an average of 70 or 80 years on this earth. I've already hit that milestone marker. I should say all of us do, unless you like James McCoy, 98. <laughs> Let's see, he retired at 62, 36 years. Boy, he has beat the Social Security system. <laughs> yes, he has. <laughs> During these years, we are bombarded with the temporary. Make money, get stuff, be comfortable, live well, have fun. And you and I, all of us, one day are going to stand before God. And we're going to give an account for our stewardship of the time, the resources, the gifts that God gave us, and ultimately the gospel of the kingdom that he has entrusted to us. I'll tell you what, I am convinced beyond any shadow of doubt, when that day comes, I am convinced we're not going to wish that we had given more of ourselves to living the American dream. We're not going to wish that we had experienced more of the good life or our best life now. When we stand before God, we are not going to wish that we had made more money. 
that we had acquired more stuff, that we had lived more comfortably, that we had taken more vacations, that we had watched more television, that we had spent more time on Facebook, that we had pursued greater retirement or been more successful in the eyes of the world out there. But I believe every single one of us, when we stand before God, we will wish that we would have given more of ourselves on a daily basis to live for that day when every nation, race, tribe, and tongue shall gather around the one who is seated upon the throne. And we shall give the Him eternal praise Amen. forever Amen. and ever. Amen. This brings us to a crucial question for every single one of us in this room today. It's real simple. Do we really believe that Jesus is worth abandoning everything to follow him? Is Jesus really worth giving up everything for him? Do you and I really believe, I mean, we talk it, we sing it, but do you and I really believe that Jesus Christ is so good and so satisfying and so rewarding that we'll leave all that we have and all that we own and all that we are in order to find our fullness in Jesus Christ? As Christians, isn't that where we're supposed to find it? Isn't our fulfillment supposed to be in Jesus Christ? Do you and I believe Jesus enough to obey Him? Do we believe Him enough to follow Him wherever He may lead? Even when the crowds in our culture today, and I hate to say this, but even in our churches today, turn the other way and walk the other way. I uh, personally have heard the invitation of Jesus, that simple one, follow me, on three specific occasions. When I was a little boy, five and a half years of age in Springfield, Missouri, I knelt one Sunday at an altar. And I'm sure a lot of people said, oh, that's just the preacher's kid. But I heard a voice. It wasn't a booming voice. It wasn't as if you were to speak out to me at the moment. But I heard a voice that I knew was a voice that was different than any other voice I'd ever heard. That's right. And he told me he loved me. And he invited me to follow him. And as a little five and a half year old boy, I said yes with God's help to the best of my ability I've endeavored to follow him all of these years since I wasn't a perfect kid from that point on in fact every evangelist that came along man I responded to every invitation every night I was an evangelist's best friend but another notch in his gun I was in college, in Bible college, had been through four years. As I got into my teen years, I tried to live off of my folks' relationship with God. I thought people were looking at me and saying, well, well they're still hasty. He's a good Christian. He really loves the Lord. You ever heard his dad preach? You ever sat one of those camp meetings? You ever heard his mom sing? Boy, she could sing the glory to him. Four years of Bible school. And in my final semester, one night in a revival service at the college with John McDuff, I went to an altar. Because I heard again that voice all of me. And I said that night God dealing with me about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. 
I've known since I was a little old kid, five and a half, that I was going to be a preacher. Never thought I'd be anything else. I did think a few times about being a big time healing evangelist with a tent. <laughs> but, shut <coughs> your But I knelt at an altar in that college chapel. And that night I said, I'll follow you wherever you'll lead. Didn't know what I was going to do. Man walked into the men's dormitory where my room was, never met him before, stood in the waiting room. I came through there and he stopped me and said, Young man, would you come preach for me? And I went to San Antonio, Texas. And there's been no turning back since then. As God has taken us different places, the pastor and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've endeavored to faithfully follow him. In a few months, I will have been credentialed 50 years with the movement that I have been a part of all that time, known as the Assemblies of God. Here's where I'm at today, church, and I don't mean, yeah, I do, I mean to cry on your shoulders. <laughs> I've endeavored to follow him, but I find myself, a guy who just turned 70, who's been in the ministry nearly 50 years, endeavoring faithfully to follow him, and I find myself today a part of a group, an organization, and a movement that I don't recognize anymore. There's no power. We've walked after other things, and we pursued other paths. We adopted the measuring stick of the world to determine success in the church. And this Jesus that twice I've heard him say, follow me, and during these past two weeks, I've heard him a third time forcefully speak to my spirit man. And as I've said yes to him, and I've followed him. It's led me to the very thing that Jesus didn't have anything to do with. We say, boy, we're, we're a great pastor, and, and I bought that for a time if our church is X a number of people. Oh man, God's hands upon him. Uh, they used to have uh, what they call fellowship meetings. People would go to from all the churches, they'd get together and sing and testify preach and eat food, fellowship mm -hmm. together. That evolved to just uh, today a minister's meeting. And that's where the preachers just get together, maybe once a month. I'll be honest with you, I'm not a good representation for you for celebrating church at the minister's meetings. I quit going. Here's what normally happens. The inside edition. <laughs> You walk into the room, and there's other preachers just like you, and uh, usually it goes like this. How you doing? Great, brother, great. How you? Oh, great. Doing great. And that conversation eventually leads to the all-important question. I mean, you run into your church now. Yeah. Mm. And I got to the point, I thought, if all of us are doing so great, what are we doing here? I've been looking, or maybe the Lord's been showing me 
Jesus spent the majority of his ministry with 12 guys. And we play the numbers game. We want to be successful by the measuring stick of the world. We want to be the in place. We want to be the current happening church in a locale. But I hear Jesus saying, follow me. Follow me. Somebody told me this a long time ago, and I've never been able to shake it. They said, when you follow Jesus, sooner or later, he's going to lead you to the poor. And this just where I'm at trying to sort all of this out in my spirit man, these past couple of weeks. And if all we ever do is arrive at 5110 Bellevue Road, and we do the same thing we've done over and over again for 13 years, and the world goes to hell, got a nice little church, but what about the poor? I ran into one last night about 10 o'clock. Raised in an Assemblies of God preacher's home. His life not where it should be. Oh, he would love to find a church in northwest Arkansas where he could come and just be himself and be loved and not meet with condemnation. How can I follow Jesus if I don't have a heart for the poor? Can I say I follow Jesus and I withhold tithes from him? That's right. Or I use it for my own advantage. There are missionaries all over this world that are struggling. There are pastors right here that are struggling. He said, follow me. We've reduced it to praying the sinner's prayer. Signing a card, shaking a preacher's hand, making eye contact, lifting our hand, whatever it may be. But I want to tell you this afternoon, it's more than that. Amen. It's more than that. It's not he's twisting our arm until we cry, Uncle. This is the one who died on the cross for you. For you and for you and for me. And when he comes along and says, follow me, how can I not but help to say, I'll follow you. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know about tomorrow. <clears throat> but I've asked these past two weeks, God, give to us people and celebrate church or bring them into our midst. I've asked, oh God, give to us young people. aren't weighed down with a lot of the stuff we as adults get enamored with. Young people like on these first couple of rows in this hotel this afternoon that God has for you something greater than what you never thought of. Amen. And he can plan your life and order your steps far greater than you ever could or some guidance counselor. And there will be no greater thrill that will ever come to your life than saying, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. 
It may not always be an easy road. There may be some heartache and hardship and issues that you will not understand. But it's going to be worth it all. And you and I stand before him and he says, well done. Good and faithful servant. So what am I going to do? Am I going to believe Jesus? Am I going to obey Jesus? Or am I going to continue with business as usual in my Christian life and in our life as a church as a whole? And are we going to let success be defined for us by the culture that is around us? Or are we going to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and follow Him? The invitation is so simple. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Or Jesus.